Okay, awesome. Um, so thank you, Vish, and to um, the organizing committee for inviting me to do this keynote. I'm very excited to be here to talk about undergraduate journals in general um, and focus on my experience with one particular undergraduate journal that we run in our department. And so just to introduce myself again, and then Vish has already kind of introduced me. My name is Evelyn Sun. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. And so good morning to some of you and good afternoon to others, depending on which time zone you are joining um, us in. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience running an undergraduate journal in our department and the kinds of benefits that students get from publishing in undergraduate journals and focusing on some of the experiences that I have with this particular journal. Um, so for my talk, I actually have three components that I wanna cover. My talk will be approximately half an hour and I'm leaving the last 15 minutes open for any kind of questions that any of you may have. Um, so the first component of my talk may seem a little bit irrelevant to undergraduate journals. That's because I actually wanna talk about a type of course known as a CURE, a course-based undergraduate research experience. And the reason why I have to introduce this concept is because our journal was born to be able to support this kind of research experience. And there's actually a very close relationship between these types of courses in our department and the journal that we've established that also runs in our department. And the undergraduate research journal that we run is called UGEMI, the Undergraduate Journal of Experimental Microbiology and Immunology. I'll introduce what the journals really are about. Um, I wanna focus on the relationship between these cures and UGEMI. And I know there's gonna be a lot of acronym. I'll try to keep reminding you what they stand for. And, and I'll try to define them very clearly so you're aware of what I'm talking about. And then at the last topic here is to actually give you an overview of how UGEMI works and how students like yourselves can get involved in publishing in UGEMI and what kind of benefits you as a student would get in publishing in an undergraduate journal like UGEMI here. So these are the three areas that I'm going to focus on. So let's start with the CURES. So CURE, again, stands for Course-Based Undergraduate Research Experience. It is a type of undergraduate research opportunity that some of you may have experienced or may not. Um, so some more traditional types of undergraduate research experience include things like internships. Some of you may have done some internships in an academic lab or in an industry-based lab or government lab. Some of you may have had research projects embedded within your courses. There may have been some summer programs that allow you to do some research. You may have had some senior capstone courses as well. So a cure is essentially one of those types of experiences, as you can see listed here, where uh, unlike some of the internships where you have more of a one-to-one -one mentorship model, where you work with a grad student or postdoc or the, or the principal investigator and you get they get to mentor you directly, it's an authentic research experience where it still follows the kind of traditional classic course structure where you have one instructor, multiple students, and maybe a couple of teaching assistants in there. And because it has that same traditional um, structure, it's also very accessible and scalable. And so it, there is easier access to all of the students in the program. We can also scale it up so multiple students can have this experience as well. And within the CURE, a student, students will work in teams and take full ownership of that research experience. So they actually get to start with designing what research project they want to pursue. And so in the model that we've designed in our department, they get to really kind of determine what kind of research questions and hypotheses they want to test as long as they're working with E. coli as a model organism. But I think some of our courses have evolved since then. And they get to go into this open lab setting where they do their research project, they collect all the data they need to answer their, hypo their research questions, and then they ultimately describe all their findings in a manuscript that we publish in that journal, in which is UGEMI. And the whole point of having this kind of course experience is so that we can help students develop these core competencies in research. So being able to participate in discovery is a really big component of doing science, to be able to work in a team, to be able to communicate your findings, and ultimately practice all those kind of technical skills are all very important to develop as a student before you get into the job market. And so this is why we develop these kinds of senior level courses. So where does the journal now come in? 
So um, in 2001, our department started offering this type of course, this CURE course, um, in a wet lab style. And so it's a lab-based course where students have kind of a lab that's open during work hours, and they will make their time to complete their projects. Um, and then in 2022, really excitingly, we also started to offer a data science version of this cure where students, instead of having a wet lab per se, they actually use computational tools and data sets to do research projects. And you can see that uh, for both of these types of cures that our department offers, there's one, there's a couple of phases in common. And one of the ones I want to focus on is the dissemination phase. So these courses always end up with students having to report the findings for their research project in a final manuscript. And we wanted a way to document all the work and research that our students do in the course. And one of the ways that we do it is by publishing it in an undergraduate journal. So at the same time that our department started offering these cures, they also established an undergraduate journal as known as UGEMI. Um, here I have a quote from Sir Mark Walpert that kind of speaks to the importance of having these kinds of journals in place in that science isn't really finished and so it's communicated. You have to be able to disseminate that research in order for it to be part of the scientific ether. And the communication to a wider audience is part of the job of being a scientist. So we want to give our students the opportunity to share their research with with a broader audience beyond their peers and have it out there as concrete evidence of their scientific practice, of their communication skills that they could ultimately put in their resume and CV um, as evidence that they've kind of done that research project, which makes them a lot more competitive for the job market. So in 2021, we also established UGEMI, the Undergraduate Journal of Experimental Microbiology Immunology, which primarily published the research that came out of these CURE courses. Um, and then in 2015, we branched out and created a kind of sub-journal in UGEMI called UGEMI Plus, where students now also have the option of actually going through a formal peer review process where their papers are reviewed by experts in the field, validated by those experts before they're being published. And it's a very rare opportunity for undergraduates to have that. And so we established kind of that opportunity as well. And I'll talk a little bit more extensively about the peer review a little bit later in my talk. Um, but going back into this relationship, so we talked about in 20, 2001, we established these kinds of research intensive courses called CURES, and we also established an undergraduate journal where students who are undertaking this research experience can then publish their findings in UGEMI. And there's actually a very important relationship between these two components. And I'll kind of explain what that relationship is through a small case study here. And this is the WZA story, essentially. So kind of bear with me as I break down these two diagrams. So on the left here, we have what looks like a timeline. And we have various different nodes and how they're connected. And then on our right here, we have what looks like a biological model, all these different proteins interacting with each other. So if you look at the timeline here, each of these nodes actually represents one publication by a student team, each one of these that are in blue. And so some of this research in this one particular area goes back as far as 2006. And this is such a small representation of the papers we actually publish. These are just papers that focus particularly on this biological model, which is the WZA model. And so starting in 2006, we had students who had an interest in this protein secretion model. And they thought, OK, you know, we want to do an interesting project no one's done before in this area. And they go ahead and research something about it. How does this protein work? What is the structure of this protein, for example? And then in the following year, students read the, the papers published by their peers. They're inspired by those papers and they follow up on those experiments. They maybe try to reproduce some of their findings. They, they do different analyses to find out more. And then over the years up to 2020, students keep following up on each other's work. They read the papers that their peers have published in UGEMI and that inspires the next step. And ultimately, all of these students here have contributed a little bit of knowledge that allowed us to build the biological model that you see on the right. Perhaps at the beginning, we were only aware that there was one protein involved, but over time, as student teams started working on this project, they started to realize you know, this protein actually interacts with this one, that also interacts with this, that does this kind of chemical modification, and it allowed us to build a more comprehensive view of how this biological system works, because every paper is then contributing to that understanding 
of this biological model. So this diagram on the right is really a combination of all the research that various different students have done over the years that have been documented in UGEMI. Um, and this is very important. This is a very important element of actually practicing science because that is essentially how science works. It's known as the continuum science where there is our natural world, and we're just trying to understand how these systems work. And every time research pu researchers publish a paper, they contribute a little bit of understanding to that knowledge base. We don't have the whole picture yet, but they elucidate a little bit. And as they publish papers, this inspires other researchers to go in and try to reproduce their findings, build off of the research that they've done. Some papers may contribute a little bit more, some papers may contribute a little bit less, but ultimately all of them are are helping us better understand how these biological systems um, and networks actually ultimately work and contribute to that knowledge base. So you can see how this diagram here, which is essentially the process of science, really mimics how UGEMI is allowing our students to practice authentic science and contribute to that continuum of science. And so that's the relationship between our journal and our courses. Um, and so now that you kind of understand why we've established this system within our department, I also want to talk about how UGEMI actually works, the concrete processes of it. And so what would it look like if you're a student who wants to publish in UGEMI? And of course, over the years, we've actually opened up UGEMI, so it also accepts external submissions and not just from the CURE courses. It was established for that purpose, but we've opened up the journal ever since. And so I've actually taken this diagram directly from the UGEMI website. And I'll actually have various different links to the UGEMI website as well available to you. But this basically shows a brief overview of what it's like to go through this process, um, where students would su submit their manuscripts into the open journal system. This is a this is an online system that we've established to help manage all of our publication process. And it's actually one that professional journals use. So students get that kind of experience of interfacing with it. Um, the manuscripts would then go to an editor and we hire graduate student editors to work with us in the summer to undergo their publication process. And they basically vet the papers to ensure that they fit within the scope of the journal, they're properly formatted within our guidelines. And then if that is, if the paper is accepted, it goes to a peer review process. This is where the paper is now shared with anonymous experts in the field, and they provide feedback for the paper that students can then implement to build a st honestly stronger paper that's been validated by experts. And then it goes through this copy editing and formatting phase where we get it ready for publication. And so that's essentially in a nutshell how the process works. But one aspect I haven't really talked extensively about is this peer review. And that's really the biggest benefit that students get from participating in this process. Um, so just to give you an overview for our publication record for this year, we had 50 submissions. As you can see, majority of it just serves the cure still, um, but we do accept external submissions. I would say on average this year, we just got a few, a little less than usual. We usually get around five external submissions from different universities around the world. Um, and we had approximately 49 publications this year. And 19 of them actually went into UGEMI Plus, which is our peer-reviewed version of the journal. And the reason why students opt to choose the peer review one and external submissions always go through the peer review route is because there's a lot of benefits in doing it. Peer review is such an important aspect of science. It is the vetting process that we have in science to ensure that good science is being published. It's not a perfect system, but it's there to be to make sure that you know we're publishing um, valid claims or publishing a well-defined data. And that, and that bad science isn't being published out there. So this is a very important vetting process in the, in, in the um, system of science, right? And so in education, we often teach students what it is because it's so important. We tell students, this is what it looks like. It's all about getting experts to review your paper. Um, but students often don't get hands-on experience. And it's very different from learning what the theory is behind this versus getting hands-on experience. It's very dis demystifying. And so by actually undergoing and choosing to publish in UGEMI Plus, students will get really significant insight into how this process actually works. And a lot of undergraduate journals really try to mimic this process in a more scaffolded way to ensure that students have experience with doing peer review. 
and it's very valuable. Um, our editors, unlike some professional journals, actually work very closely with our students to guide them through the process because I think it's more important to go through this process in a more guided and scaffolded way, in a more educational uh, way approach than actually throwing students into a formal peer review process in a professional journal, which can have quite a learning curve. And so our editors do work closely for you to recognize how the process actually works. Um, it allows you to actually publish a much stronger manuscript at the end of the day that you know has been validated by experts. Have, you have feedback implemented from those experts in the field. And at the end of the day, you also kind of get to develop all these different transferable skills that you just get intrinsically from going through the process, whether it's your communication skills, organization skills, professionalism, as well as your ability to interpret feedback from experts and incorporate that into your manuscript. Um, this is just a brief example of what, what some of the kind of reviews look like. And so this is from a recent paper that we published just this year. And so the way that we structure our peer reviews is that we give our reviewers, which can be grad students, postdocs, principal investigators, professors in various universities across the world, um, where we get at least three per paper who get this form where they have to now break down the feedback based on sections of the paper. So this individual now is kind of looking at the introduction and saying, you know, it, the introduction does present itself well, but here are some areas where it can improve itself. Um, here are some better ways of defining the methodology. And then in the discussion, they're a little bit more critical about, you know, I don't think your data says this. Make sure that you are communicating this correctly. Unlike professional journals, we don't require our students to go back and redo lab analyses um, just because sometimes our students don't have access to a lab at this point. Um, but we do have a limitation section in the paper where if there are limitations with the methodologies, they can properly communicate it and anything that they can incorporate in terms of feedback has to be something that they can edit into the wording of their manuscript. So then once the feedback goes through, the editors work with the students to discuss and interpret the feedback, to talk about strategies for tackling it, and then students go about actually editing their manuscript and making sure that all these concerns that e experts have, all this feedback that these experts have, are coded into your manuscript, which again, improves the scientific merit of your paper. And ultimately, you can get it published into a peer-reviewed journal. And I would say it's very, it's such a great piece of evidence to have on your resume or CV when you're applying for a job to have a peer-reviewed article here, even if it comes from an undergraduate journal, just because it's so valid to show that you have the skills to undergo this kind of process. Um, in terms of external submissions, which is probably something a lot of you may be interested in, um, in regards to at least you, Jemmy. Um, so all the cure the papers that come from our cure courses, our senior courses there, um, have gone through this vetting process by the instructors, by the teaching assistants, where they actually go through a process of working with the students to ensure their papers are um, publication ready. So they are endorsed by the teaching team. Um, we require external submissions to have the same kind of process. And so we do require faculty or mentor endorsement letters before you publish your paper with us to ensure that you do have somebody from your institution that is backing the publication of your paper, that has looked at your paper and ensure that it is ready for publication. Um, I have, UGEMI also has its own specific guidelines of how to format and submit material. And so we do ensure that everyone follows those guidelines and we accept submissions up to May 15 every year and then they get published in the summer period. And so the peer review normally happens around July, August and the papers are published by early September. And so that's kind of what our deadline is like. And I have again, the link to our journal from a student from the Mount Royal University in Calgary. Okay, um, so just to conclude, I'll just summarize a couple of takeaways that I've gained from working with UGEM in the benefits that students get from publishing publisher opportunity to just take part in such a big part of the process of science, which is disseminating your work to a broader audience and having that actually as evidence, concrete evidence of your scientific practices, of your communication skills that you can include into your resume and see that just makes you more competitive when you enter the job market. It provides students for going through that peer review process, which is often a process that we may teach in theory, 
but students don't often get that kind of hands-on experience. And undergraduate journals can provide often a more scaffolded and student-friendly approach to actually allowing you to go through that peer review process, which will help you a lot once you be, you decide to kind of go into the next step in your career and you have to publish into a formal journal. Um, there are several different scientific and transferable skills that you get from participating in publication that isn't just communication skills, it's also professionalism, organization skills. Um, it's also a really good gateway for students to actually be a part of this continuum of science. And so this continuum of knowledge that I've described as to why we have that relationship between the cures and our journal. And so there's these are some of the kind of takeaways that I have as benefits that students get from working with undergraduate journals. And that kind of concludes my talk. And now I'm actually happy to take any questions that anyone might have. And so I'm not sure how you want me to field questions here, Vish. Sorry, I'm like showing up very bright now. All right, okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, if people just want to raise their hands, uh, that, yeah, like they'll get sort of pushed up to the queue. Um, so yeah, I guess we can kind of go in that order. So we can start off with Jay. Yeah, so I asked a similar question elsewhere, but um, so this is today, is actually the first time I've ever heard of cures at all. Um, and as a student journal that has only really had the external process, it is a very appealing way. It's something that as someone who's done research myself, I wish I had had available in previous yeah. years because of how helpful it seems. Uh, my question is sort of twofold. Um, so one, uh, at my university, we're on a term system, 10 week terms, um, three times a year, as opposed to 16 week semesters. Um, and secondly, we don't have anything particularly like this. What is your advice for setting this up, getting this started, and perhaps even adapting it to a 10-week term? Yeah, I would say the first thing in getting like something like Cure set up at university, and they are actually starting to get picked up in more and more institutions across the world. Um, I would say it's just faculty buy-in. That's the first thing. It's really finding a faculty member who's kind of willing to establish this within your institution. Um, but it isn't to say that research from cures are the only kinds of research that you could publish. There's research from capstone courses, research from um, even less extensive research projects, um, internships that can also be published in an undergraduate journal. So there is actually an opportunity to publish research that may be done in a different context. And establishing a cure is very much something that's done at a faculty level at somebody there has to be a professor that is willing to buy into the concept and help develop that as an internal process yeah okay thank you so right. i guess oh, oh sorry okay it's good uh, i think that you know dr sun you and i have actually talked sort of uh you know off screen of this conference about like uh undergraduate research journals and cures um I think that in general, like, you know, among your takeaways, a lot of them can, you know, be, I guess, applied to undergraduate research journals, sort of like J's that are more like fully student run. There's not a whole lot of faculty involvement. I was wondering if you could sort of like go into what like a faculty advisor would bring if students don't have a whole lot of like faculty involvement on their journals. And maybe, you know, maybe why students should be more open to having faculty involvement with the journal, like um, maybe like what you what students here could ask of a faculty to help them sort of improve on their journal, uh, stuff like that. Because as I said, like the majority of students, I think that are uh, at this conference uh, or viewing the recording uh, are going to be from journals that are like predominantly student run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is very important to have a faculty advisor in any journal, even if it's primarily student run, just because a faculty member is someone who has a lot of expertise in publishing in the professional world in their particular field. And so they can actually go in and validate the process just to make sure that we are following 
you know, industry standard practices within a journal to give students a more authentic experience, but also keeping in mind that they, they, these are students. So we still also want to do it in a student friendly manner. Um, but validating the process itself is very important. Just keeping it as authentic as you can. Um, I think that faculty members can also provide feedback on aspects that maybe students may not be able to see that may be deficiencies in their journal. And I think that's very important. Even if they're not super hands-on, I think it's still important to have a faculty advisor where you can't say, you know, this is how we're running things. Can you help us just determine where if we might be able to optimize things or which parts maybe don't mimic what it's like to publish in a professional journal that we can maybe integrate into the process itself. So I think that's really important. Second element of having a faculty member is that you may be a little bit more ingrained with the undergraduate programs themselves. So there may be opportunities like you, Jemmy, to actually have your journal partner up with a particular course that in that course, students generate some kind of manuscript that is publication worthy. And that could actually be a really nice relationship for these journals as something that you are actually helping that course publish and that course is using it within the course itself. Um, kind of like the relationship we have between the cures and UGEMI. And so having kind of a little bit of a person that's embedded with the program can also see different areas where you can actually integrate this journal into the undergraduate program themselves, just to make it more accessible to multiple students within the program. Yeah, Heather. Thank you. Yeah, let's go into Heather. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Sun. Thank you so much hey. for coming. I really enjoyed your talk. I had a question for you kind of um, based on your experience with cures. I know my university does have cures as well as like vert vertically integrated projects going on and classes, but as editor in chief um, for my journal, a lot of times I don't end up getting people submitting their work because they say that they're afraid that their research isn't good enough or that their writing isn't strong enough or that it's not, you know, a real research project because they didn't, you know, apply for a huge grant from NIH because they're an undergrad, things like that. So how do you encourage your undergraduate students to have enough confidence in their work and in their project in order to actually submit it to the undergraduate research journal? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, first of all, the students have to recognize is that these, that these are undergraduate journals for a reason, right? We don't have the same amount of funding as an academic journal. Um, like students in the Cures are doing these projects in four months. They're not doing it in four years. So the scientific rigor is going to be different. Um, but that isn't to say that good research hasn't been done. And so I think it's still also important to just encourage students just to go through the process, you know? I think even if you're if they don't feel super confident with their paper at the beginning, going through a process maybe will help them actually increase their confidence, especially as they're actually getting some of that feedback from experts, they're implementing it. The paper you get at the end is very strong, I would say, once you go through that process, and that will boost confidence quite a bit. I would actually encourage you to partner up with the instructor for those courses and say, like, we have this amazing journal. This could be a really good platform for your students. Why don't you make this a requirement? And I, some of that, some of the, like, I would say responsibilities for getting some of those papers to be publication um, quality would actually fall into the course then. You could say, like, why don't you make these guidelines for our journal on how you would publish this as integrated into the requirements for the course, into the rubrics of the final manuscripts that they submit. Um, and so students have these strong manuscripts that come out of the course that are actually following the publication guidelines of your journal. So these directly feed in there. And I think that's one of the really great ways to kind of establish a relationship between the course. So work with those instructors and see if they want to do that because it's it's very beneficial to their students to have that opportunity. Like the publication for you, Jemmy, doesn't happen during the course. It's not within the four months. It happens outside of the course, but all our students go through it because we want them to have that opportunity to do it. I almost make it a requirement for them to go through the process because there's a lot of things that are valuable to them that they may not see right away until they're actually in in the process of that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, so I had, <laughs> I mean, you know, I have a lot of questions. I just like chatting with you in all honesty, Dr. Sun. But uh, you talked a lot about like faculty buy-in to a lot of um, efforts 
with, you know, involved in undergraduate research journals. I was wondering, like, what are other forms of faculty buy-in that you see are, like, maybe a little bit more easier for professors themselves? Like, for a lot of us, you know, who don't have that much faculty interaction with our journal, like, what are some good steps that we can take to get them maybe a little bit more involved just to, like, increase maybe, <clears throat> like, the credibility of our journal or the, um, yeah, the... What am I? I forgot what word I'm trying to use, but yeah, like the credibility of the journal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say the best way to promote faculty buy-in is kind of to approach this. Faculty members are very busy individuals. They have a lot on their plates. Um, it's maybe starting just by giving them a few responsibilities saying we would love to have this partnership with a journal because we think it'd be valuable to have your input. Um, but maybe not require so much of them because you guys are doing all the heavy, heavy lifting anyways, right? So saying like, oh, we don't require you to do any of this or manage any of these papers, but we would love if you would kind of look at the process, maybe meet with us once or twice a year to talk about it, or look at some of the papers, let us know where we can kind of improve the process, let us know where we can integrate some elements from professional peer review processes into this. Um, and I think that's kind of, it's minimal work. I think that helps a little bit, um, but it also gets them by and because they're helping to contribute to this kind of process. And I think it's important. The more, the better the relationship you build with instructors that have maybe courses that feed well into undergraduate journals and kind of really showing them how this integration can benefit their courses as well is also a great way to get buy-in. Yeah, I think that's some great advice. I guess I wish I'd heard earlier, but like, you know, early in my undergraduate career, but yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Does anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, no worries. I feel like I don't want to take up all the time with mine, so. Yeah, that's okay. Sorry, I'm just going so to... I, I should probably exit the... How do I exit the screen share? There you go. Oh, yeah. Um. So I guess maybe like my last question, I guess, is maybe like a, a more broad one, which is like, in general, I think students are like, I don't know, maybe a little bit wary of bringing on faculty members as editors or, you know, like they're... At least the students that I've spoken to are a little bit wary of like losing control of their journal uh, from students to faculty. Um, and, you know, I, I think that a lot of journals nowadays ha are starting to bring on like an editing team of faculty in addition to like a student editing team. Um, and so I was hoping maybe you could like, maybe not ease some worries, but like, you know, sort of go into like, how like a potential faculty editing team wouldn't necessarily like remove a lot of the benefits that you mentioned that students gain from being on like you know in the process of undergraduate research journal yeah i actually don't know what a faculty editing team will look like to be honest I think you're um, I would say but... we always advise your role where I actually don't force oh oh sorry is that okay no? sorry yeah you're you're good you're now good? before I didn't okay really... yeah okay um so I'll start again um so what I was kind of saying is I would think that a faculty member's involvement in an undergraduate journal that's primarily run by students should be very advisor based to begin with um I think it's good to get feedback if you like from like here's some of the papers that we published is there anything about them that we could improve some maybe improve some of the guidelines but it should always be at an advisor level I actually don't foresee faculty members participating as editors in any way I still think that should be a responsibility of the students that are running it um, that's what they would do and so just keeping them at arm's length as advisors would be very valuable and I think that's the kind of role the faculty members typically take in undergraduate journals anyways. Yeah. 
for us, it's kind of rare because it's not undergraduate run. So we do have faculty members that take the lead on it, but I do actually let the graduate student editors really handle most of the process. My job is just to kind of check in, to help them establish different systems in the journal that would just facilitate the process itself, just to authenticate the process a bit more. But that's really kind of primarily my role as well as other faculty members that are involved in our journal is more about informing the process. But the process itself is still very much carried out by our graduate student editors. And so just having that very clear expectations set. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting you there. But that's okay. Yeah. So if there aren't more questions, um, I think we can probably like safely end the session just a little bit early. Um, so here, I will stop the recording.